So I do want to let you know about, uh, I was waiting until I got all of your cards to make this announcement, I'm just kidding. But next week, uh, we're gonna go political. Um, and that's not my fault. Uh, it's one of these things that God works out in his schedule. If you read, today we're dealing with Genesis 46. If you read Genesis 47, it's all about Joseph working with the government to enslave the entire population. Um, that's what God brought before us. So with the election coming up, it gives us a good opportunity to take some time and reflect about um, what, how the Christian is to act within the structure of our society and our government. So I'll go... Um, uh, political, but as you, uh, I'm sure that you've, uh, you understand this already, that um, I don't seek to do this, but uh, typically when I, if you're going to give a sermon on something like that, you're going to offend both sides of the aisle uh, because God's truth is offensive. And so I hope that that would be the same for us next week. But really what I plan on doing is to share a little bit of, of, again, how the Christian, uh, what the Christian should do in our society regarding politics, regarding government. Uh, but then to, uh, next Sunday night, um, we're going to have a special time uh, if you're able to gather at six o'clock for prayer, but we're also going to have a uh, sermon um, that I had watched uh, a few weeks back um, from a pastor in an SBC church in, in Texas that uh, while I disagree with some of it, and we'll talk about uh, the things that I would disagree with, uh, he makes a uh, very biblically reasoned, he takes a very biblically reasoned approach uh, to what the Christian should do or what the Christian at least should be praying about and asking God to do. So uh, again, uh, that'll be next Sunday night, six o'clock, special time of prayer. Uh, this is all. And again, it, it's, um, I love how God does this. Like if I would have had to give a sermon like this back in August, who cares? You know, it's in one ear out the other. It's the Sunday before election day. <clears throat> and so, um, I believe that it's something that God wants us to hear. So that'll be happening next week. Hopefully that means that you'll be here uh, and not skip out on it. But this week we're working through Genesis 46. So I want to ask you if you remember the first time that you left home. Not like leaving home for, oh, I'm going away on vacation, but like the first time you really left your home. The place I grew up in, in Erie, I was able to live there from about the age of four, uh, and then my mother sold that house on my 25th birthday. Have any, or yeah, here you go, happy birthday, now you're homeless, Greg. Um, that's kind of how it worked out for a few weeks there, or two months actually, 21 years that I lived in that house. I had brothers and, and sisters that lived there, my parents obviously, my father died in that house. Um, after my mother moved to North Carolina, I had two of my friends who were under house arrest at the time living in that house. That's the time I met Nicole. And she, you know, we're talking and she comes up to visit and I'm like, well, I have two guys that uh, are under house arrest right now, so don't be freaked out by that, I'm not one of them. Um, I had another friend who is now a pastor. He was living in the basement of this house at one point. Uh, and one of our funny stories is un unbeknownst to us, like they had nothing to do with the house arrest people. We were growing mushrooms in our basement. And I had no idea, like we were moving his furniture around. And it was, I guess it was a dark, dank kind of basement or something that would uh, allow for the growth of mushrooms. And so... Um, yeah, they weren't being grown illegally, just kind of grossly. Um, but that home held all of my memories from my childhood. All my different Star Wars toys, my Transformers. I had a basement door 
uh, going into like this random room slash bedroom at different times. Uh, it was this old wooden blue door. And so my friend and I in middle school, I don't know what it was with middle school kids in the 80s, but how many of you guys that were like children in the 80s, how many of you collected knives or sharp things? Am I the only, psych I guess I'm the only psychotic one. Um, so at that time I was collecting knives and I had all these like ninja stars. And so what we decided to do was trace my outline on this door to give us target practice. You know, so we would just sit there for like hours just throwing these ninja stars all these different ways because that's what they did in the movies. And so like that door was just trashed um, by the time we moved out. I remember many, many hours spent in that house just banging away on drum sets and uh, in, in different practices with bands. But then came the time where it was time to leave. As I said, my mother had sold the house and I was going to move to Greenville, uh, Pennsylvania in two months to start my student teaching placements. So for about those two months, I was living basically in like a, uh, I was living with my brother for a few weeks and then I lived with my nephew for a few weeks as they were preparing to sell their house. And the only family I had left in Erie at that time was a brother, as I said, and a couple of nephews and nieces. Everyone else from my family had moved or passed away. And so I can remember going apartment hunting with Nicole. She was helping me find a place where I would live for about four months. And it hit me then that I would be alone for the first time. And it's kind of ironic that I'm talking about this on a Sunday when I'm the only one from my family here. Um, again, I didn't work it out that way. My son Eli is homesick. As I said, Nicole's away. Um, and so I remember just dealing with that, uh, that thought of, I lived in one place for like 20 some years of my life. And now in the span of six months, I'm going to live in five different places. And in fact, um, I was entering a time where between graduating from college, moving to Pittsburgh to be closer to Nicole, moving back to Erie to serve in my first church, then getting married, buying a home, and then preparing to move back to Pittsburgh with Nicole and now Caleb as a baby at that time. From 1998 to 2004, I lived in nine different places in six years um, after going for 20 years or 20 some years in the same place. So I went from knowing my home to kind of feeling like a nomad. That, that moving didn't settle down until 18 years ago when Nicole and I moved into the house that we're in now. But during that time of leaving home, there are a lot of things that you can learn about yourself. You see that you are indeed more independent than you realized. You see that uh, there are things that, you see the things that are the most important in your life. You start throwing away or selling all of the things that you once thought you couldn't part with. You realize that as long as certain people are present, then no matter where you are, where you're sleeping that night, you're home. But I remember my last night in that home of my childhood. I remember how empty it was. Um, my mother had taken most of the furniture uh, with her. Uh, I was, you know, just a single guy living in the home, uh, so I didn't need a whole lot. And I remember I slept on the couch that night uh, because we were going to, the people that were buying the house were going to keep the sectional. So I slept on the couch that night in the living room and it's just me. I remember going from room to room that night and just kind of standing in the middle of the room and, and taking in all of these different memories. Uh, over the years, I ended up staying in all four bedrooms in that house, the, the one in the basement uh, and then the three that were upstairs. I could, for different reasons, I was in all of those rooms. 
But there was one room that was primarily my bedroom. And I remember all those nights as I stood in that room for the last time, I could remember all those nights struggling to go to sleep. And in fact, I just shared that with, with someone this morning, how um, there are certain songs from 70s and early 80s TV shows that when I hear that theme song, it triggers this response in me of, oh, I got to go to bed. Like I hate the, the, the theme song, the closing for Taxi. It was like the most depressing thing for me because I knew it was a sad song to begin with, like a sad sounding song. But when that song came on, it was bedtime. And so even today when I hear that song, I just get this like this feeling. And, and I can remember standing in that room and, and thinking of all those times where I struggled to go to sleep. And so I would turn on my radio uh, and listen to, to music as I faded into sleep. I remembered sleepovers and I remembered, now this is for younger people in the room, just to show you how awesome, truly awesome the 80s were, I remembered this thing. <laughs> what is that, you might ask as a young person? That is a waterbed, youngins. It's a nylon mattress that you would fill with water you would get into this bed, and if you had a full wave style, you would just kind of lay there rippling uh, for a while. And you could set the temperature to 90 degrees, which in Erie in the dead of winter was amazing and horrible at the same time because you could hear the, the snow being blown all over the place, and, and it's, you know, seven in the morning, and I have to walk over a mile to get to high school, and I'm I'm like, no, I'm in this 90 degree bed. Why on earth would I go out into this 15 degree day? The water beds, um, oh, I loved my water bed. And it was one of these things that uh, if you're interested in buying one today, like I don't know what happened with them. They, everybody woke up one day and they're like, yeah, this is the most kitschy or thing ever, kitschy thing ever. We never want one of these again. But if you do want one, I did some searching. You can still buy a waterbed from Walmart if you have two thousand four hundred dollars to spend on one, uh, or go to Grandma's house and she might have one in that one room that she keeps locked up all the time. So I did have some other memories of that room, though. It was in that room where I surrendered my life to Christ. And as I took that final tour of my house, I remembered kneeling next to that waterbed. Uh, two weeks before I graduated high school uh, and, and repented of my sins and kneeling there with my Bible waving back at me because it was on the, the waves there and just pouring my heart out to God. And I surrendered my life to God in that front bedroom of 1317 West 20th Street. But something else happened when I repented and believed in the good news. I didn't realize it at, at the time, but my home had changed. Now, what do I mean by this? Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 11 to 12. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Again, he says, you are strangers and exiles. Hebrews 13, 14 to 16, for we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. In John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. 
so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So we see clearly that we as Christians, as followers of Christ, this place is no longer our home. We can still like parts of it. I still love the beach. I'm still amazed by the sights like Niagara Falls. And I'm still in awe every time I drive through the Fort Pitt tunnels and I see my city lit up at night. No matter how many times I do that, it's like, it's just a highlight for me. But deep down in my heart, I know that this world is no longer my home. We are simply passing through now on our way to our home that Christ himself builds for us. So I want that which Christ builds, not this, which, which though there are some beautiful sights, I also see a lot of pain because every time I see something like a beach, I know that there are families that are being ripped apart there. And every time I visit Niagara Falls, I know that there are those who are being trafficked into that city for sinful reasons. And every time I see my beautiful city lit up at night, I know that if I take a closer look, the drug abuse, the homelessness, the crime, the sins of that city will break my heart and make me want to have no part of it. So though I see beauty in this world, it only goes so far. I long for the place where I can go and see beauty that lasts forever. To see a beauty that sin never approaches. To be in a place where that which God had built, nothing will destroy or rot away. That is the home I was promised. So what do we do then when we have to leave home? Maybe I'm talking to the young adult and giving advice to you on what to do when leaving your home of your childhood for the first time. Maybe I'm speaking to you as a parent as you're dealing with the thought of your child leaving for the first time to go away to a weekend camp without you. And I hope that you would be able to take these, these points and see them applied in your life and in your child's life but really what I am getting at is how do we prepare to leave and go into that which is not our home? Every single day we have to do that as followers of Christ. We have to leave our home, if you will, our time with God and go out into the world. So how do we prepare for that? To get to, to, get to that, I want to look at what happened when Jacob finally made his way to Egypt to be reunited with his son, Joseph. We need to remember, though, what all was happening for Jacob as he was preparing to move to Egypt. We have to go back to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. Abraham was given a number of promises by God, and one of those promises was for land. Abraham, too, had to leave his home and travel to a new place where when Abraham was now in this, this new land, God said to him, I am going to give this to you and your offspring. That offspring did not come about for a long time, though. Isaac was not born until Abraham was quite old. And there were a lot of struggles along the way before Abraham could experience the promises of God. But eventually Isaac was born and then later had his own children, twin sons, and through a bunch of lies and scheming and through God's will, the promise of the land was given to Jacob. And talk about struggle. His name literally means to struggle with God. These promises did not come about easy. More on that in a second. Jacob, he ran out of town, found a woman or four, made his way back, lied to his brother about coming uh, home, and now here he was, finally in the land that God had promised to his family. All 12 sons and more. And even when experiencing this promise from God, there can still be some bad things that happen, like having your children lie to you about what they did to one of your other children when they sold him into slavery. So what we see in Abraham's family and in the promises that God gave them 
is that just because God says he will do something in their lives and in the history of mankind, that does not mean that it's going to be a cakewalk. You can have both a promise from God and a lot of fighting to get there. Just because God says he will do something in your life does not mean that your life will be clear sailing for the rest of it. And that all you have to do is not worry about any of these struggles because now that God is guiding you, you'll never have another struggle in your life. But it also means that just because God promised you something and now you're struggling with something, that doesn't mean that God abandoned you either. The point from our message today, though, is not about suffering or promises. It's what you do when you leave home. So please join me in reading Genesis 46. We're going to look at four different ways, four things that can be done or remembered when we leave to go into the world. Now, we're not going to read the entire chapter because I do not want to stupefy you with the way that I pronounce some of those names in the middle of the chapter, names like Ohad and Aki and Muppim and, and good old Aird. Like, we're not going to get into those people, thankfully. So... What do we do when we want to leave home? Starting in Genesis 46, uh, 1 through 7. Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba. He offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. That night God spoke to Israel in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he said. And Jacob replied, here I am. God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. Jacob left Beersheba, and the sons of Israel took their father Jacob in the wagons Pharaoh had sent to carry him, along with their dependents and their wives. They also took their cattle and possessions they had acquired in the land of Canaan. Then Jacob and all his offspring with him came to Egypt. His sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, indeed all his offspring, he brought with him to Egypt. So the first thing that we see that Jacob did when preparing to go out into the world is that he first remembered what God had done. We read in verse 1 there that before Jacob uh, left, he went to Beersheba. Now, what was this place, you ask? This was the place where Jacob's grandfather made a peace treaty with this other ruler uh, called, uh, his name was Abimelech, or his title was. And it was concerning some wells that Abraham had dug. And later Isaac, Jacob's father, had an issue with these wells once again with a different Abimelech. And so they made a treaty between the two of them. And in both circumstances, Abraham and Isaac, they were able to see how God's hand was at work in bringing about the promise of the land being given to them and their offspring. So when Jacob was nearing the place where he knew God had brought um, peace to his brother and his, or to his father and grandfather, he made some offerings there. He worshipped God in that place because he wanted to make sure that just as God was with his father, God would now be with him. And you even see a callback to this with that significance uh, with, with God saying, I am the God of your father. In verse 1, he is described as the God of his father, Isaac. So this was a place of significance for Jacob's family and the promise being realized. Before he could go to Egypt, before he could even leave the promised land, he first had to go to where God had already done something and remember. So when we get ready to leave our childhood home, or when we get ready to leave our home and head out into the world every single morning, the world of our schools and our jobs, of errands and meetings, first let us remember what God has done in our lives and in the lives of those around us and in the lives even of those before us. 
And it's interesting, again, I, don't, I wished I could say to you that I give things this much thought when I plan out Sunday mornings. I don't. But the verse that the Chandler shared, the moment of surrender, how it starts with, you are my God, I didn't plan that. <laughs> but I've heard some people where they've been kind of offended by the fact that God is described as the God of my father Abraham or the God of my father Isaac or Jacob. And obviously the goal is to have that God become my God, like David said. That, that's the goal of every parent. That's the goal of every follower of Christ. They take it to mean, though, some people have said this, where, uh, like, if I say the God of Abraham, it's because Isaac hadn't accepted God yet. But I don't believe that's the case, because it's not a reference that, that God is anybody's. Rather, what they are doing is remembering what God had done in Abraham's life. That's why it's the God of Abraham. What did God do in Abraham's life? The God of Isaac. What did God do uniquely in Isaac's life? I pray that my children will serve the God of their father's life. Because when they do, they are not remembering me. They are seeing God's work in my life. And they will then have a faith that God can do the same thing in their own lives. So when we head out into the world, or when you head out into the world every single day, I pray that you would remember the God of my life. I pray that you would remember the God of Stan's life and remember how God healed him from a stroke. I pray that you would remember the God of Mary's life and remember that God gave her the joy of becoming a mother when at first it just wasn't happening. I pray that you would remember the God of Sean and Jody's lives as you remember how God saved their marriage or the, the God of John's life and remember how God brought a man who was so far from him for so long, how God brought him to salvation. I pray that you, would re, that you would be able to call upon the God of Jimmy and remember that even when we turn away from him, he is faithful to chase us down and bring us back to him. Remember the God of, of Debbie and Julie who feel like though they've never done anything that crazy, that you would see how God was able to protect them from the really bad sins in life. I pray that you would remember the God of Lucy who kept her faithful to him until the day of her death. I pray that you would remember the, the God of Patrick and Summer who sustained, who sustained them through the greatest horror that any parent will ever face. And I pray that you would remember the God of Jeff who brought a man who experienced such racial hatred in his life where he grew up looking at the National Guard encamped right outside of his bedroom window and remember how it was only God who could take that experience and turn him into such a lovely man who loved his church and God's people with such a strong, faithful, and obedient love. Before going out into the world, before facing the pain and the loss and the evil and the temptations of this world, stop and remember the God of the people that you worship with. If you're struggling with remembering the God, my God, then start thinking about the God of everybody else that you are here with and see what he has done in their lives. Time's running out here. There's a bunch of food down there, so I have to hurry. Second point that I want us to see is how Jacob believed in God's promises before going. Look again at verses 2 through 4. That night God spoke to Israel in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he said, and Jacob replied, here I am. God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. God reiterates his promise to Abraham 
and his offspring and reassures Jacob that even though you are going to Egypt and leaving the promised land, God is still going to bring your family back. But notice something here. Instead of God talking about the promise of Abraham or the promise of Isaac, notice now how he personalizes it. He says, I will make you into a great nation. This has kind of been a, a theme of my preaching through the book of Genesis, if you haven't noticed. Believing in the promises of God. From the beginning of this book, God promised that there would now be hard work and pain in life because of the fall. God promised that one day he would send one who would stand in between mankind and Satan who would rescue us. God promised to judge the world with rain and flooding and now promises to never destroy the world the same way again. Promises made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, promises to their offspring being a blessing to the entirety of mankind and that those promises are now fulfilled in the life and the ministry and the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you are facing uncertainty of leaving home for the first time or leaving your home and going out into the world of bullying and prejudice and false accusations and people having it out for you at work and layoffs and firings, consolidations, downsizing, the world of temptations and addictions, the world of abuse and pain and theft and murder and abandonment, the world of failing health, the world of a health diagnosis that you do not want and it scares you and your loved ones. Even when you enter into the world of facing your oncoming death, believe in God's promises. For He has promised to care for you. He has promised to be your strong tower. He said that He will protect you. He said He will be near to you to hear your cry. He promised to bless those who delight in Him. He promised that all things will work together for the good of those called according to His purpose. He promised to finish the work that He started in us, to comfort us in our trials, to supply our needs. Jesus promised us rest, an abundant life, eternal life to those who trust in Him. He promised that He will return for us one day and that He goes to prepare a place for us. So believe in the promises of God. Another thing that we see with Jacob as he prepared to leave home was that he did not go alone. Again, I'm not going to read all the different names in the middle of this chapter that just lists name after name of the family that traveled with Jacob. But see in those names that God did not call Jacob alone into Egypt. He called them. He called all of them. Christian, I probably do not have to say this to you because you're here. But maybe for those watching at home, or when you go out into your jobs and you're, you have an opportunity to talk to somebody that says the lie of Satan that, oh, I don't need to go to church, I can just watch it on TV. Please know that you cannot experience God in as rich, dynamic, or beautiful way by yourself as you would if you were a part of a church family. This was brought to my attention again this past week. Two, two different ways. We had someone who needed some support and encouragement due to some things that were happening in this person's life. Someone from our church wanted to be a blessing to someone else and simply gave a gift of, of money um, to be a ministry to this person. And when I was able to hand over the envelope to this person, it was pointed out how wonderful it is to be a part of a church and not just watching people on TV being the church. Because no one on TV, no one on the internet has ever given this person any money to help in a time of need. It happened because we live in community 
because we are a family and one person saw that another person was struggling with some things in life and wanted to bless that person. That's the church. That's the church that we are called to be a part of, to live in, not to watch. And then on Wednesday night, what a blessing that was. No one expected the turnout for that spaghetti fundraiser that, that was held for Jeremy. This is what it looked like for most of the night. There were hundreds of people who came through those doors to be a support to the Dawson family. And at one point I approached Kim and said to her that this turnout was a testament to hers and Jeff's and the boys' character, their love for their community and their love for God. I'm sure that over this past year, there have been many times where Kim, Todd, Jeremy, and Craig felt alone since the passing of Jeff. But Wednesday night, seeing that turnout, and more than that, seeing the way that their church family was there to support them, I know they did not feel alone that night. That's the church. And we should not go into this world thinking that we are alone. If you feel that way, then please take a step of faith and become a greater part of the family of God. Don't just show up on Sundays because you're shortchanging yourself. You're missing out on the opportunity that God wants to give you. I mean, it's wonderful in all that you're here on Sunday mornings, but you're missing out on so much more that God wants to do in your life and that he wants to do through you by not being involved, by not being a part of a bigger family, an eternal family. Stop trying to face this world alone. Jacob didn't do it that way. Jesus didn't even do it that way when he was facing the cross. He asked his three closest to go with him and pray for him. What does God need prayer for? Yet Jesus exemplified it for us. He reached out to his community. He reached out to his faith family, his brothers, and said, I, I need you to pray for me right now. Don't go it alone. It's not going to get you extra brownie points with God in heaven. He's not going to look at you and say, oh, look at how strong you were. You lived your faith by yourself all of your life. It breaks his heart because you are missing out on more of him through the lives of those around you. So don't go into this world alone. All right, food's calling. So Genesis 46, 28 to 34, please. Now Jacob had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to prepare for his arrival at Goshen. When they came, when they came to the land of Goshen, Joseph hitched the horses to his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. Joseph presented himself to him, threw his arms around him, and wept for a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm ready to die now because I have seen your face and you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his, fa to his father's family, I will go up and inform Pharaoh, telling him, My brothers and my father's family who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They also raise livestock. They have brought their flocks and herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh addresses you, and asks, what is your occupation? You are to say, your servants, both we and our ancestors, have raised livestock from our youth until now. Then you will be allowed to settle in the land of Goshen, since all shepherds are detestable to, e to Egyptians. So very quickly, notice how at the end of this chapter, it talks about how um, the family, when they were home in the promised land, they were shepherds. And now that they were in Egypt, what would they be? Shepherds. Folks, guard your hearts and don't let this world change you. I know it's just a simple thing of, you no, know, we're not our occupation. I understand that. But this is helping us to see, it's illustrating in a way, who you are at home ought to be the person you are in the world. And who you are in the world ought to be the person you are at home. I've seen it 
both ways where people mess it up, where they act uh, all holy and, and righteous on Sunday mornings, but then when they get home, they're tyrants. And I've seen people who, who are jerks in the church, and yet when they get around their workplace people, everybody loves them. And I'm like, well, I don't understand this. Why does everybody love you except your church people? You're, we're doing this backwards. Guard your hearts and don't let this world change you. Don't let the politics of the times, don't allow the fears of the world, don't let the hurts of this place, this world, change you at your core. Stay true to the calling that God has placed on your life. Okay, so Pastor Greg, what is my calling? Proverbs 31, 8 to 9. Speak up for those who have no voice. For the justice of all who are dispossessed. Speak up, judge righteously. We're not supposed to judge. Judge righteously and defend the cause of the oppressed and needy. Matthew 6, 33 to 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Mark 16, 15. This was our verse last week for the moment of surrender. Then he said to them, What is my calling? Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into the world. Ephesians 4, 1-6, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Philippians 2, 1 to 4. Again, we're talking about what is my calling. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if you have any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if you have any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way. Having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. You see why the world struggles with verses like this, because the world tells us, no, you do you. And God tells us everyone should not look at his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you received mercy. So let us do what this verse calls us to do. It says to proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. With everything that we know about what we have to do in order to step out into this world, we need to praise God. We need to remember what He has done. We need to make sure that we stay the same. We need to, to believe in His promises. And I don't remember what the third point was at this point. I hope somebody wrote it down. Look to God and see the ways that He is faithful and see why we are to praise Him. It's the same thing that Jacob did before he left what did he do? He went and he offered a sacrifice. He praised God. Do we praise God when we leave our home and go out into the world? Do we praise God when our children leave the home and we know we have done everything that we can as parents to train them up in the way that they should go? So God, I praise you. I hurt, 
but I praise you at the same time because I know that you are faithful. Do we praise God before we leave our home and go out into the world? Let's praise God now. Will you please stand? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do not allow us, you do not want us to go into the world alone. That you work in mighty ways in our lives across so many different lives where we can see how you are faithful to bring about the promises that you have made. So God, we pray, as David prayed, we pray that you would be my God, our God. But we also recognize that you are the God to every person in here who loves you. And so when we are struggling with times where we can't remember what you have done in our own lives, help us to look to the lives of those around us. It's why one of the reasons why you give us a church family, that we can look to others and say, that, that time that I saw how God, how you were the God of this person, I need that in my own life. So provide that. And I pray that you would help us to believe in your promises. God, that we would not grow weary in serving you and being righteous for you. God, I pray that you would keep us from feeling alone, that if there are steps that we need to make to become a greater part of the family of God, then help us to do that, Lord. And God, I pray that you would help us in everything that we do to stay true to the call that you have placed upon us. God, I pray that this world would not change us. I pray that your presence and your ministry would remain fruitful in our lives. That the person we are when we are with you, the person we are when we are in church, and we are living aware of your presence, God, help us to be aware of your presence throughout our entire day. When we're alone, when we're with those that we can be comfortable with, God, help us to remember that you are there with us and we should live according to your ways. We ask these things in your name, Jesus, and we pray now that you would receive the sacrifice of praise. In your name, amen.